Welcome back to 20, chapter 23, part two, where we'll conclude our lecture for our other measurement and disclosure issues. So our sixth learning objective is to identify the accounting issues related to subsequent events and those faced by unincorporated businesses. So subsequent events are those that have a significant impact on the company and that take place after the statement of financial position date. So after say December 31st, our financial statement of financial position date, but before we actually issue our financial statements. So we haven't posted or issued our financial statements yet, but something's happened in that middle period past the balance sheet date or the statement of financial position date, but before we've actually done anything with our financial statements. So under IFRS, the date that we have as that cutoff point is the date that the financial statements are authorized for issue. So the date that the board of directors approves the financial statements. Under ASPE, it's more of a matter of judgment, taking into account the management structure and the process for completing the financial statements. There are two types of subsequent events. There are events that provide evidence about conditions that existed at the statement of financial position date and affect the estimates used in preparing the statements, such as, and these are reflected in the statement of financial position and the income statement by recording our adjustments. And they include information that would have been recorded in the amounts if the, statement, if the information had been known at the statement of financial position date. And an example of this is a settlement of litigation. If the event giving rise to the litigation existed before the statement of financial position date or a loss on accounts receivable due to a customer's bankruptcy where the bankruptcy existed before the statement of financial position date. So as an example, let's say that you had a lawsuit and you were being sued in November and at December 31st, you said, we don't know, it's, it's unlikely that we'll lose and it's not measurable. So you simply disclose that in your statements. But then before you issued your financial statements, say in Janu early January, so you hadn't actually completed the audit and issued the statements yet, you actually lost the suit. Now, all of a sudden, the statement that you made in your financial statements, that it was unlikely and you couldn't measure it is not, is not true anymore because now you know you've lost the suit and now you know you owe $10 million. So under IFRS, we would go back because that the lawsuit existed prior to the financial statement date. So we would go back and adjust that estimate. The second type of subsequent event is an event that provides evidence about conditions that did not exist at the statement of financial position date. Some of these may have to be disclosed to keep the statements from being misleading. And if they have a material impact on the company's future, for example, the company burns down. Like if the company burns down, that doesn't have anything to do with what happened at December. The company wasn't already burning down at December, but it could materially impact the future of the company. So it would need to be disclosed in the notes, but it wouldn't have changed any of our measurement as at December 31st. In that case where the company burned down, a subsequent event may call the going concern question. So can the company continue into the foreseeable future? And if this is the case, then there may need to be additional note disclosure. And it's possible, worst case, that we would need to remeasure the assets and liabilities to, re to reflect a liquidation market, depending on the event. Unincorporated businesses. Accounting issues facing unincorporated businesses are similar to those facing incorporated ones, except the question on how to define the economic entity, because it's an unincorporated entity, say it's a partnership, it extends into the personal. So there's not that clear boundary and they clearly need to indicate salaries, interests, and other similar items accruing to the owners. And there's no provision for income tax because in a partnership, for example, the partners are taxed individually so ASPE provides recommendations regarding unincorporated businesses, regarding defining the entity and recording accruals to the owners, but ASPE does not have specific guidance in this regard. Okay, our seventh learning objective. Identify the major considerations relating to bankruptcy and receivership. Bankruptcy is a legal process that occurs when a company or individual is unable to pay its debts. 
Companies facing bankruptcy can make a proposal to their creditors to pay a percentage of what was owed or for an extension of time available to pay off their debts or both. Companies can also use the Company Creditors Arrangement Act if the amount owing is less than 5 million. And under the Creditor Arrangement Act, companies can request short-term protection while they prepare an offer to creditors. So in bankruptcy, we're gonna have the bankruptcy, we're gonna have a proposal and the CCA proceeding outlining what. So basically companies have time to make a proposal to creditors to say, here, do you want this? It's better from them having to come in and seize assets possibly where they have potentially more to lose and it's a lot more work for them. Now that's what bankruptcy is. What's a receivership? So a receivership process is typically started by a secured creditor or a group of secured creditors if a company defaults on a loan. The main categories of creditors are secured creditors. These have a legal claim on the assets, such as a lien. Preferred, so the first priority, say employees for unpaid wages, and then unsecured, no security or collateral. A receiver is appointed by the bankruptcy corp to take possession of, manage, and liquidate a company. And companies in receivership or under CCA protection may no longer meet the going concern assumption and may need to use a liquidation approach to preparing their financial statements. Objective number eight, identify the major disclosures found in the auditor's report. An important source of information is the auditor's report. And this states whether there's a, 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 an unmodified opinion if satisfied that the statements prevent, present fairly in all material respects and in accordance with GAAP, the company's financial positions, income statement, balance sheet, and cash flows. In some situations, the auditor is required to express a modified opinion. So this happens when there's a scope limitation, like they don't have enough information on a certain area, a disclaimer opinion or withdrawal from the audit when the scope limitation is both material and pervasive or a qualified opinion if they just, they can't get, say that the financial statements are free from misstatement. An adverse opinion is required if misstatements are so material and pervasive that a qualified opinion is not justified. So those are the types of audit opinions. Learning objective number nine, describe methods used for basic financial statement analysis and summarize the limitations of ratio analysis. <clears throat> and we've been talking about ratio analysis in the end of each chapter or in the end of many of our chapters, not every chapter. So we're just gonna kind of sum that up here. So financial statement analysis, we can obtain specific information from the financial statements by examining the relationship between items and looking at trends. And there are, we can, we can figure out things from looking at the ratios of what those trends are telling us. And, but there are limitations in terms of doing this. The financial statements only report on the past, they're not predictive. The ratio and trend analysis doesn't explain why a ratio is going a certain way. And a single ratio alone is not likely to be useful. It's really a group of ratios moving in a certain way. And if the company is changing their accounting policies, that can definitely muddy the waters. Various techniques are used in the analysis of financial statement data. So there's ratio analysis, there's horizontal analysis, so looking at the proportionate change between years, there's vertical or common size analysis, where we reduce all the dollar amounts to percentage of a base amount, there's trend analysis or the examination of related data, like going through the notes of the financial statements. So we've got different types of ratios and they measure different things. So we've got a liquidity ratio, like a current ratio, a quick ratio, or a current cash debt coverage ratio. And these measure the short-term ability to pay maturing obligations. We've got an activity ratio, like receivables turnover, inventory turnover, or asset turnover. And these measure how effectively the enterprise is using its assets. We've got profitability ratios, like gross margin, profit on sales, return on assets, et cetera. And these measure financial performance and shareholder value over a period of time. And last, we've got coverage or insolvency. So debt to total assets times interest earned debt, cash debt coverage. And these measure the degree of protection for long-term creditors and investors. 
Of course, there are ratio, there are more, as we talked about before, there's limitations, historical cost, items like depreciation and, and all the accounting accruals can make the ratios less meaningful. And companies aren't necessarily comparable company to company and across industry because of the choices that are allowed for accounting policies. Oops. So here's an example of a horizontal analysis. So you can see that the horizontal analysis indicates the proportion between the years. So we've got the, um, we've, we've taken the numbers in the bottom box there and turned them into, into ratios. So you can see that we've got the difference and the change um, in the bottom. And so we're really looking at the overall percentage change and the difference between on the income statement and then looking at the looking at the percentage change between the numbers. Oops, sorry. So vertical analysis is the proportionate change of each item to a base figure. So here we've taken, you can see that down here, we've taken the actual net sales and amount from the income statement and turned it into the proportion. So the percentage of the total revenue for each of the years, and you can see where everything is going. So again, it's important to note that limitations and analysis arise from a number of uncertainties. The nature of role, the financial statements, they're not really exactly designed to do that type of analysis. The business operations could be changing and there are financial statement measurements and managements and motives and intentions can also be making the numbers move. Learning objective number 10, identify differences in accounting between IFRS and ASPE and what changes are expected in the near future. Well, for disclosures, <clears throat> there's a variety of things. So IFRS is continuing to work through, um, work through reducing accounting policies. Excuse me, my goodness, I'm so sorry. So accounting policy are working on reducing the choices and ASPE has a greater range of choices for accounting policies. They have fewer, dis fewer disclosure requirements. They don't require segmented reporting and provide no guidance for it. They provide no guidance for interim reporting. Ironically, they have, they, they are, ASPE is the one standard that requires remeasurement of related party transactions. I for us just records, we just requires the disclosure of the transaction and subsequent events. So IFRS requires the period between the financial statement date and the date that the financial statements are authorized, whereas ASPE requires it between the statement of financial position date and the date it's issued. And that's because under ASPE technically, um, in theoretically, there's less strict procedures around the, the authorization for the financials. So it's more about just when they're issued under IFRS because more public companies have boards, they're the ones that are proving the financial statements to be issued. So because there's that extra layer of authority in there, then that's the cutoff for the subsequent event period. And IFRS doesn't require any information about unincorporated businesses, but ASPE does require specific information about the entities and its owners to be disclosed. So looking ahead, the IASB plans to start the process of revising and updating the new exposure, exposure draft for management commentary and practice statement. And there's a variety of other disclosure uh, projects in the works for IFRS. And that concludes chapter 23. And not only concludes the chapter 23 lecture, but concludes all the lectures for this course. So congratulations, you did a great job getting through the material. Please join me for the tutorial section so we can look at some questions for chapter 23.